Good morning and welcome to worship at Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're with us to worship together. I'm Jean Castor and I will be serving as your lay leader today. A special welcome to everyone joining us online. If there's anything we can do to help you feel a part of the life of the congregation, please email or call anytime. We'd also like to welcome Fran Griffith, our guest organist who's filling in for William Byer this Sunday. We're glad she's with us as well. All of our hymns, prayers, and congregational responses will be projected on the screens. Full printed liturgies and large print bulletins are available from the greeter. The offering box is located just inside the door at the rear of the sanctuary. We will bring these gifts forward later in the service and dedicate them to Christ's mission. Blue prayer requests and information cards are located in the pew rack in front of you. To share a prayer request, fill out the slip and pass it to me during the passing of the peace. We'd love to pray with you. We will now have the ringing of the Trinity chimes, followed by the introit and the call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The message of the cross calls us to worship. We hear the wisdom and power of God. Christ the Lord is risen, alleluia. Alleluia, the Lord is risen today. Please stand as you are able and join in singing our opening hymn, number 238, Thine is the Glory.
Please join me in the call to confession. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Just as we all have died in sin, we are all raised to life in Christ. Trusting in God's grace, we confess our sin. God of grace and mercy, you create a new order for our lives. Service before success, faith before knowledge, partnership over independence, the cross over the crown. Forgive us when we fall into the patterns of this world, rejecting your call through our action or inaction. Forgive us, God, and move us to see the world through the lens of your great love. Forgive us, God, and grant us peace. Take a moment for silent confession. Beloved, hear the good news. Christ is risen from the dead and sin has been defeated. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? We are forgiven and raised to life. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved siblings, children of God, may the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet each other with a sign of peace. All right, this is, woo! How about now? I'm still a little hot, I think. Um, so this is that moment in the uh, worship service when I invite any kids within earshot uh, who would like to come forward uh, for the scripture reading. And if you are comfortable where you are, be comfortable where you are. And we do a little show and tell. Uh, so Ryan, may I have the show and tell? Y'all know what those are. Those are nine, count them, nine of the most recognizable brand logos in the world. Um, I don't know who surveys that kind of thing, but um, you know who all of those brands and companies are, right? And a lot of these, there's like, there's no text on these, right? It's just a symbol and it communicates everything you need to know about the brand. Uh, which is really convenient uh, because we're talking worldwide here, so these uh, brand logos are recognizable even if you don't read or speak English. It's just an identity. Um, and people who design logos and uh, advertising try to make uh, things that recognizable. And they try to make their brand seem really familiar, or really reliable, or really trustworthy, or maybe really elegant, or exclusive, or high status. It's all about being the best in whichever way that brand has decided to position itself as the best. We have, of course, another 
highly recognizable brand symbol uh, that stays up there at the front of the sanctuary uh, every Sunday, all the time. And as Christians, we worship not around those brands up there. We worship around the cross, which is, yes, very, very recognizable, uh, the world around. But the cross is not a symbol of being the best. It is not a symbol of being familiar. It's not a, a symbol of being exclusive or high status. The cross that we gather around to worship as Christians is a symbol of rejection and suffering and loss. And we gather to worship not around these exclusive brands, but around this cross because we want to point away from what we might otherwise think is the best. And we certainly want to point away from ourselves, and we want to point your attention to God. We want to point away from ourselves and toward God, because Christianity teaches us through this cross Christianity teaches us that God uses what might seem not like the best, but like the very, very worst to become good news for us. God turns what seems like the very worst thing into good news for us. Let us pray. Living God, with joy, we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, and then 17 through 25. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible Translation. Please follow as I read along. Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each of one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in Paul's name? Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord.
So this is the story of how Corey found Jesus. Corey was on a youth group mission trip, and they spent a week in a deeply impoverished section of a big city. Four hours from home for Corey, but it was a world apart in life experience. And Corey had heard enough about this city to know that he had no idea what to expect. He knew that there would be this inner city poverty that was so different from his own experience that there would be just miles and miles of abject need there in that place. And that's what it looked like when he arrived. There were empty storefronts in what used to be a business district. There were vacant lots everywhere, and the remaining houses were just in terrible disrepair. Well, Corey and his youth group worked all week with some alternative high school students who were learning building trades. And they could not have been more different from Corey's suburban youth group there to help somehow in that location. Help is maybe a strong word for what happened there. It was really awkward to negotiate how these groups were supposed to relate to each other how they could help, how they should help. These local workers had so much more skill than Corey's group had, and these groups had no experiences in common with each other. Now, the local guys, they were gracious. They were good hosts as well as they could be, or maybe they just didn't feel like they could be quite 100% honest with Corey's youth group. And every now and again, you could see the frustrations kind of coming to the surface there on the work site. And then every night, Corey's youth group would go back to the mission center and have their reflection time that evening, and the reflections got difficult. The group started to ask, now, what difference are we actually making here? How can we actually be in relationship with the people that we're here to serve when our lives are so very different. And every day, Corey's youth group learned just a little bit more about the job that they were there to do. And every day, Corey's youth group set down just a couple more of their preconceptions. And eventually, they learned how to honor and follow the people that they had come supposedly, to serve. And Corey's youth group started to share stories and in-jokes with the youth group, uh, from their youth group, stories and in-jokes with that local crew. And the local crew, well, they started to talk about their own lives and their own dreams, and then eventually to talk about their own disappointments and frustrations with the place that their community had in the wider world around them. And by the end of the week, that local crew invited Corey's youth group to go and celebrate the time that they had spent together down there in the park with snacks and basketball and music and hugs and laughter. We are starting a series of scripture readings this week from uh, the letter, the first letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and this is, uh, we're going to read this through the remaining uh, weeks of the Easter season. First Corinthians is one of those letters in the New Testament uh, where leaders from the early church, Paul wrote a lot of these, there are some other leaders who wrote some of the other letters as well, uh, trying to address how it is we in the church can live into the new reality of the gospel in the world. See, the gospel has gone out and started spreading to all creation, just like we read last week in Mark chapter 16. And 1 Corinthians in particular is all about the question of how is it that the gospel actually brings us together? How does the gospel actually unify us as one people? How does 
How are we as the church called together in the Holy Spirit? And what does that community look like? How are we united in the Holy Spirit? How can we support each other? How can we relate to each other? How can we hold each other accountable for this shared life in Jesus Christ that is present among us? So this letter was written by the Apostle Paul, and uh, Paul's whole ministry was going into new cities and founding churches. So he arrived in Corinth, and he founded this church, and then he moved along, but after he had moved along, he heard about some really divisive problems going on back down the road in Corinth, and so he wrote this letter to address the problem there, this letter that Gene started to read to us this morning. And as he addressed these problems, he tried to call the church back to the basics, back uh, away from the, the wisdom and the signs that we might look for as shaped by the world around us, and back to Jesus Christ, the power of God. And so he recalls his very first preaching to the people of Corinth. He says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come preaching God's secrets to you like I was an expert in speech or wisdom. I had made up my mind not to think about anything while I was with you except Jesus Christ and to preach him as crucified. I stood in front of you with weakness, fear, and a lot of shaking, my message and my preaching weren't presented with convincing wise words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I did this so that your faith might not depend on the wisdom of people, but on the power of God. This too is the word of the Lord. So Corinth. Corinth was this prosperous crossroads city in ancient Greece. And as a crossroads trading city, it was filled with different ethnicities, people with different religious ideas, and there was a lot of competition for people's attention and loyalty. And the Christian church that Paul gathered in Corinth, Corinth was a mixed group of people. There were rich and poor people, there were ethnically Greek people, there were ethnically Jewish people, there were different values and ways of thinking. Today you might call it a purple church there in the city of Corinth. And Paul founded this church and ordained leaders there and then moved on. That was the pattern of Paul's ministry. Well, after Paul moved on to another city, he was followed in Corinth by another traveling evangelist named Apollos. And Apollos arrived with a different style, a different tone, and what sounded very much like a whole different message. And very soon, the church in Corinth was divided. There were groups following different ideas, arguing with each other, avoiding conversations with each other altogether, and the community was broken into these different groups that identified themselves with these different leaders and ways of being. So if you're ever worried about the modern church, about the state of affairs in the modern church, all you have to do is read the New Testament, and you find that these stories in the New Testament are all too familiar from where we stand right here today. There were Christians in Corinth who were following whatever the most charismatic preacher they could find, who were seeking a gospel that appealed to the identities that shaped them in the world and that were shaped more by the values of the world around them than they were by God's living word with and within them. Now, everybody in the church in Corinth called themselves Christian, and that was a big thing to claim in these very early years of the Christian church. Everybody in the church in Corinth called themselves Christian, but they were formed and they were shaped 
not so much by the gospel, but by the world around them that gave all the wrong reasons to identify yourself with this part of the church or that part of the church. Because the world tends to prefer to divide and conquer, to separate us against each other for purposes of money or power or other kinds of social control, and it is hard for us to get beyond the things that divide us and find what is truly unifying about the gospel. That's the fundamental question that Paul is going to be addressing as he writes this letter back to the church in Corinth. The fundamental question of whether the gospel is truly more fundamental than these human identities, these identities of these human communities out there that divide us from each other. And Paul writes again and again and again that yes, the gospel is more fundamental than that. The cross of Christ is more fundamental than anything else that would separate us from each other. That what brings us together, despite those mixed identities, beyond those mixed identities, even through those mixed identities, the thing that brings us together is the cross of Christ. That cross that we have spent so much time during the season of Lent and now into the season of Easter reflecting on. That cross of Christ is what brings us together. Because that cross of Christ disrupts every other identity that we might hang on to. The cross, Paul writes, is foolish in terms of human wisdom. However, however sophisticated we think we are, the cross of Christ tells us that our sophistication does not capture what God is up to. The cross is scandalous in our religious terms, no matter how good we are, no matter how faithful we may think we are, the cross tells us that God is up to something bigger than just our religious identities. The cross of Christ calls into question both our human ways of seeing ourselves and our religious ways of identifying and understanding ourselves. The cross calls us to let go of ourselves. The cross calls us to let go of ourselves. And we let go of ourselves so that we can step into the promise that the cross opens up for us. Because the cross all along has been opening up for us a resurrection, a resurrection that can only come through that cross. And again and again, that will be the message of this letter Paul writes to this church long ago that he could have been writing to this church right here today. So Corey had to set some stuff down. Corey had to set some identities aside on that youth group mission trip. He didn't just go have fun there in that city. He didn't which is what he thought he was there to do, he went and found neighbors. He went and found neighbors that he never had before. He went and found a true community right there in that strange city. And finding that community meant that he had to set down some wisdom that he had brought with him. It meant that he had to look for that community in ways that were not indicated by the signs that he expected to see. This was not easy, it was not straightforward, and it didn't even live up to his expectations. It didn't live up to his expectations, but it exceeded his expectations. Because he took up the hard work of being present with his neighbors. He took up the vulnerability of deep listening and understanding. He took up a willingness to belong not to himself, but to Jesus Christ. And he found there a real place. He found there a real place filled with real people in a real community living real lives beyond his expectations, people who are his actual siblings in Christ, 
by the power of God made real for us on that cross. The quarry found Jesus on that trip. He found Christ, the power of God, the reality that is revealed to us and through us as we live into the church's mission in the world through that cross. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn is number 321, The Church's One Foundation. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. the body of Christ. We are parts of each other. And so if one suffers or celebrates, we all celebrate or suffer together. So trusting in God, we lift up our joys and our concerns in prayer. In the continuing Presbytery cycle of prayer, we lift up the First Presbyterian Church of Dallas Center. We lift prayers for Marcy Campbell as she completes rehab at Wesley on Grand. We lift prayers for Mary McCauley as she recovers from surgery to replace her pacemaker battery this last week. We lift prayers for Christina Harris as she prepares for major surgery this week at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester. We lift prayers for Patty, a neighbor of Ann McGowan. Patty is in the hospital with a broken kneecap and internal bleeding. And we lift prayers for Alana Rice, Christine Rice's daughter, as Alana prepares for surgery a week from Tuesday uh, to continue healing from prior surgeries. We gather all these prayers and we lift them up before God. O oh God of love and mercy, you have called us and all your children into one family, through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus. By his gracious presence, we look with new eyes at the whole human family in its brokenness and pain. We seek your strength and determination to embrace them, love them, heal them, and share with them your great good news of hope and new life. Hear us as we lift up to you our deepest needs, our pressing burdens, our fears and hopes. Be near us, we pray, as your people. Help us to receive your many gifts with gratitude and faithful stewardship. We pray for those who suffer pain or illness, for the lonely and despairing, for the lost, 
and worn and battered of our world. We lift to you the leaders of this and every nation, community, and faith, that they would be guided by your spirit and aware of the needs, especially of the least of their people. And we pray for those whose lives are closely linked to our own, for your church in Dallas Center, for Marcy, for Mary, for Christina, for Patty, for Alana, and for these we lift up in our hearts. We pray for all these and for our own needs, which we offer to you in faith. To the sick, O Lord, give your healing. To the grieving, give hope. To the dying, give your peace. And to all of us, O God, give faith to go forth from this place, determined to live in the light of your good news in Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we offer to you our prayers and our lives. Amen. from God and we too belong to God. And so we offer the gifts of our lives which we will present uh, right after this moment for mission. This Easter season, the Presbyterian Church USA collects the Pentecost offering. If you make a donation to the Pentecost offering, it helps encourage, develop, and support young people. 40% of the Pentecost offering will be kept here at Covenant, going towards our youth group mission trip this summer. The remaining 60% is used to support children at risk, youth, and young adults through ministries of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. In June, myself and even other youth, eight of us total, plus two chaperones, will be traveling to Chicago for four days. We will serve the Lord through an organization called Urban Plunge. This organization puts together youth mission trips focusing on urban settings. We should get our finalized itinerary next month, and we are very excited. To give to the Pentecost offering, you can use a small envelope in the back of your pew and place it in the box at the sanctuary exit. You can give online at pcusa.org. This offering will be dedicated on Pentecost Sunday, which is May 19th, so you have until then to make a do donation. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to sharing more mission trip details with you as we get closer to our travel dates. With gratitude for our youth group, their upcoming mission trip, and all the ways that God blesses us through the power of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to stand and join in singing our song of praise. Let us pray. 
Holy God, you upend the wisdom of the world by raising as your scepter the cross of Jesus Christ. You offer abundance through sacrifice and call us to hold fast to your love by giving ourselves to one another. Receive these gifts as signs of our participation in your kingdom, so that all the world can know the life of Christ, in whom we pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to remain standing and join singing our closing hymn number 246, Christ is Alive. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Therefore, let us go into the whole world and proclaim the good news to every creature. Alleluia. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and all the saints, and every gift of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Alleluia. Amen.